Jason. Just want to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event. I'm Emily. I'm one of the events hosts here at Powell's. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming events by visiting our website at powells.com. In the coming weeks, we're looking forward to welcoming Daniel Kraus on August 4th and Molly Weisenberg on August 5th, among others. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as if you haven't already done so, you can sign up for our weekly events email at powells.com. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Steve Olson in conversation with Tom Carpenter. Steve Olson's previous books include Eruption, the Untold Story of Mount St. Helens, Mapping Human History, Discovering the Past Through Our Genes, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. He lives in Seattle, Washington. Tom Carpenter is an attorney and the executive director of Hanford Challenge, a regional watchdog organization that seeks a safe and effective cleanup of the Hanford nuclear site. In the Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age, Steve Olson uncovers the history of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, where the fuel that drives modern nuclear arsenals was first produced. It is both a gripping exploration of the crucial role science plays in our nation's defense and economic security, and a clear-eyed examination of the creative genius and moral failures of the figures who define our current nuclear era. So this event will also include a Q&A. You can see the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, you can try clicking that more button and it should pop up. Please use that if you'd like to ask a question as well. If someone asks a question you'd also like to know the answer to, you can upvote that question to make sure it gets answered. Um, and perhaps most importantly, please consider supporting Steve Olson and Powell's by purchasing a copy of the book. I'll be sharing a link to buy the book in the chat a couple of times this evening. And uh, now please welcome Steve Olson and Tom Carpenter. Thanks, yes, and good idea to support Hanford Challenge as well, since they're doing such important work. Um, you know, the, when I knew I was going to be writing this book, the very first thing I did was see if Tom would go out for lunch with me so I could ask him questions for a couple of hours. Uh, and I've been asking him questions uh, ever since then. In fact, uh, this, this book was published last Tuesday. And one of the nicest things that I've heard about this book since it was published is when Tom told me that there were things in this book that even he didn't know. So I figured that that was uh, quite an accomplishment uh, since Tom knows pretty much more about Hanford than any other person. Uh, it's always a, a great talk, a pleasure for me too to talk at Powell's. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there to talk with you in person as I was when my book about the eruption of Mount St. Helens came out. Although as I, was, as I was telling Emily, it's probably just as well since I can't really go into Powell's without spending at least three figures. Uh, but as soon as, as soon as I-5 is open, I'll pop back down there and, and pick up another big stack of books. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit about the two major scientific developments that made Hanford possible, and also about how the operation of Hanford led to the horrific environmental contamination uh, that is still being cleaned up today, more than 30 years after Hanford stopped operation. And then I'm gonna ask Tom a couple of questions. Um, still, I can't avoid the opportunity to, to ask him more questions all the time. And, uh, and, and he'll probably have some for me, and then we'll answer as many of your questions as we can. So I'm gonna share my screen here and hope that this works properly. There, it looks, looks like it is. Okay, great. So if the origins of Hanford can be traced to any one man, it's to the chemist in the dark suit in this photograph, Glenn Seaborg and uh, his uh, former graduate student, Art Wall in the light suit. On February 24th, 1941, at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, these two men uh, discovered a new element that they named plutonium, and they did so in this laboratory right here. This photograph, of course, was taken several decades later in the same laboratory where plutonium was discovered when it was being named a, a National Historic Site. You know, uh, Glenn Seaborg and Art Wall said that they were always tried to be as careful as possible in doing their experiments in this laboratory, but when they made it into a National Historic Site, they had to thoroughly scrub the entire room to uh, at least cut down on the radiation that was uh, in the countertops and floors of this room. So Seaborg and other uh, scientists like him had been doing fundamental research on heavy elements like uranium. And what they discovered is that if you add a neutron to the most common isotope of uranium, you create an unstable isotope of uranium that decays in this two-step process that I've shown here. Uh, the, the neutron uh, makes uranium-238, uh, the most common isotope of uranium, into an isotope called uranium-239, which decays 
within a couple of days to another unstable isotope, a neptunium-239, which subsequently decays itself in another couple of days to what, uh, the, what I've called in this diagram element 94. That's uh, plutonium-239. And uh, unlike its uh, precursor isotopes, plutonium-239 is actually an extremely stable isotope. It remains essentially unchanged for thousands of years. So normally a discovery like this would have been splashed all over headlines all over the world. A scientist discovers a new element in a, in a laboratory. But in this case, Seaborg and other scientists realized pretty quickly that plutonium, it was at least possible to use plutonium to make atomic bombs. In fact, uh, in this photograph that I showed you a second ago, um, they're holding uh, the first sample of plutonium, which they stored in a cigar box uh, that they used to make the critical measurements to determine whether or not uh, plutonium would work in atomic bombs. So the other scientist who was responsible for the creation of Hanford was this man, Enrico Fermi. Uh, Enrico Fermi, a world famous Italian physicist, he had fled Italy uh, right after winning the Nobel Prize in 1938 because his wife was Jewish and Mussolini had been implementing the same anti-Semitic laws that Hitler had imposed on Germany. After coming to the United States, uh, en Enrico Fermi worked with another emigre scientist named Leo Szilard on a machine, essentially, that they called a pile, because that's what it was. It was a pile of graphite blocks and spheres of uranium that was designed to produce a nuclear chain reaction where the splitting of one uranium atom would lead to the splitting of more atoms and in sort of an exponentially growing process. So by 1941, when Seaborg was doing his work, Fermi and Szilard had made progress on their device, uh, which today we'd call a nuclear reactor, uh, but they still had not achieved a self-sustaining chain reaction. And they really, in 1941, weren't very close to getting there. So that's when these two pieces of science came together. When Glenn Seaborg discovered plutonium and scientists realized that it could be used to make an atomic bomb, they asked, how, how can we do this in practice? Because Seaborg and Wall had made just absolutely minuscule amounts of plutonium, not even enough to see in a microscope. They got their neutrons from a cyclotron at the University of California, Berkeley. But now to make an atomic bomb, you were gonna to have to make pounds and pounds of plutonium. So remember what you need here to make plutonium is uh, uranium-238, that's abundant uh, in, in uranium ore, and lots of neutrons. So um, you would need to make lots of plutonium, you're gonna need lots of neutrons. And to this day, there's only one way to make lots of neutrons, and that's in a nuclear reactor. So even before Fermi and Szilard got their piles to work, uh, first, uh, they were working at Columbia University and then at the University of Chicago. The focus of their research had already changed. Now, what they wanted to do was demonstrate that a nuclear reactor could be built uh, to make plutonium. So by the beginning of the winter of 1942, they had constructed their largest pile to date under the stands of a football field at the University of Chicago. So this is a very famous experiment, one of the most famous experiments of the 20th century. And how it's usually presented is that Fermi wanted to demonstrate that a nuclear chain reaction was possible. And that's true. He did want to do that because that was going to be essential to being able to make plutonium. But that was his second, and in, in, in this case, almost more important objective. He wanted to demonstrate that a nuclear reactor could be used to make plutonium because even at that time, the large scale, nuclear reactors were being designed uh, that the United States government would use to, um, to make plutonium for atomic bombs. So less than two years later, uh, this nuclear reactor was, had been built along the, uh, the right bank of the Columbia River in South Central Washington State. I grew up about in a small town named Othello about 20 miles away from this reactor. This was called the B reactor. Uh, a few months later, two more reactors came online. One was called the D reactor and one was called the F reactor. The F reactor happens to be the one that's on the cover of my book. And as I said, this, so the, in this picture, the B reactor is that sort of blocky building between those two water towers, which held emergency cooling water in case something went wrong with the reactor. So this was the first large scale nuclear reactor built anywhere in the world. I mean, all nuclear reactors today are descended from this reactor. If you watch the, 
the show Chernobyl, you'll you remember that at one point after the reactor exploded, these blocks of graphite uh, are flying through the air. And that's because uh, uh, the, the Chernobyl reactors were basically descendants of the reactor built at Hanford and built using, uh, using graphite blocks. So today, the B reactor is part of the Manhattan Project National Historic Park, which also includes sites in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, but you know, to my mind, I've been to all three of those places, and the B reactor, which you can tour today, well, you can tour after the pandemic gets over again, uh, is really the most impressive site of all of the, the parts of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. When you walk into the room that faces the reactor, Tom's been in this room many times, I'm sure, and see the, the face of the reactor, a gigantic block of graphite with these with aluminum tubes that pierce the graphite. And what would happen is operators would, would, would put these uh, uranium fuel elements into those tubes uh, from this, in this face of the reactor. I mean, seeing this thing, especially when you know what it does, it just takes your breath away. It's just remarkable. And you know, this thing is exactly the way it was in 1944. There have been very few changes made to this device since Enrico Fermi was there and was starting this reactor up in September of 1944, less than two years after he demonstrated that uh, small scale nuclear reactor. Really, this is, this is one of the most uh, important uh, technological sites of the 20th century. Um, we're very fortunate that a small group of Hanford engineers and other people associated with Hanford worked for decades to preserve this place. It has a lot to teach us, not only about how Hanford operated in the future, but about some of the issues that we, that we face. So during the Cold War, the um, uh, Hanford continued to make plutonium after, the, after World War II, and eventually nine nuclear reactors were built along the banks of the Columbia River. River. This shows three of them. The N reactor is in the foreground. Actually, the B reactor is in the distance of this photograph. You just barely see a black smudge of smoke rising from the power plant of the B reactor in the distance. Uh, Plutonium was used in the very first bomb that was detonated. We just had the 75th anniversary of the Trinity test a couple of weeks ago. That was a test to see whether plutonium was going to work an atomic weapon. The, the Hiroshima bomb used uranium from Oak Ridge, so that did not use plutonium. But then the Nagasaki bomb again used plutonium. Even by the time the Hiroshima bomb was dropped, the bomb makers knew that the future of weapons would really rely on plutonium. Plutonium gener generates more power pound for pound than does uranium. And uh, it, it was sort of the obvious choice with which to make the small pits that are at the center of essentially all of our nuclear weapons today. They're, they're all sort of built around a Nagasaki bomb uh, to be able to do this. But it's a two-step process uh, to make plutonium because what happens in a nuclear reactor is that some of the uranium atoms turn into plutonium atoms, but then you need to extract uh, that plutonium from the uranium to be able to use it in a, in a nuclear bomb. And the way you do that is in these gigantic plants, I'm having trouble uh, getting this to work, these gigantic plants, there are five of them at Hanford, and these things are immense chemical processing facilities. They're really they're the, the chemical process that Glenn Seaborg and Art Wall developed in, in um, Berkeley, scaled up by a factor of a billion. And again, this was done in just a few years. It's just absolutely astonishing that they were able to get this entire process to work. Uh, my grandfather worked as a steam fitter at Hanford, and uh, the Hanford workers used to call these things Queen Mary's because that's that's what they look like. They're, and they're the size of ocean liners. In fact, it was these chemical processing plants that got me interested in writing this book because um, I, was, I was at Hanford doing a magazine story uh, back way back in 1983. And we were driving through the desert with a Department of Energy official. And I saw these huge concrete buildings that were rising out of the desert. And I said, what are those things? And he said, well, that's where we make, uh, made, the nuclear, uh, made the plutonium for our nuclear bombs. And I said, boy, that's, that's got to be an incredible story. I knew absolutely nothing about that at the time. So the way these plants work is that essentially uh, you put the irradiated uranium fuel elements into one end of these plants and they go through a variety of chemical processing steps inside the plant and a very tiny dribble of plutonium comes out the other end and that's the plutonium that has been used to make our nuclear weapons ever since, ever since the Trinity test and the Nagasaki bomb. 
and then the pits that are in our nuclear weapons today. But in the process of doing this, uh, this chemical separation process generated huge quantities of toxic chemicals and radioactive isotopes that had to be disposed of during the Manhattan Project and during the Cold War. All five of these plants just produced a, a, a huge amounts of chemicals. So the operators and the government overseers of Hanford figured that, well, they didn't know exactly what to do with these chemicals, so they would just have to uh, they had to assume that future generations could figure out what to do with all these wastes. So what they did is they pumped all of those chemicals into these huge steel tanks that they then covered up with sand and dirt. So here you can see 12 of these tanks uh, during construction. And, and these things are huge tanks. If you see some of the trucks uh, around there, you can get a, a sense of the size of these things. There are 177 of these all together, and they contain about 56 million gallons of these chemicals, which are both toxic chemicals in and of themselves, but then they're also contaminated with all kinds of radioisotopes. I mean, if you held a glass of the material in these tanks uh, at arm's length, you'd be dead in about two minutes. That's how much radioactivity these things generate uh, when, when, when the chemicals were first put into them. So by, uh, by 1970, we had more plutonium than we would ever need. At that point, we had 30,000 nuclear weapons. And as the number of nuclear weapons has dropped over the years, those plutonium pits in those weapons have been taken out and just put on the shelf uh, for uh, either future weapons or hopefully to be disposed of in some manner, which is still being argued about at this point, how to get rid of all that excess plutonium. And by about 1990, the uh, mission of Hanford had transferred to cleanup. And that cleanup has been going on ever since. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that cleanup as we, as we get going here. But you know, I wanted to conclude with this one last photograph. This week is the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima bombings and the Nagasaki bombings. For this book, I spent um, uh, a week in Nagasaki walking through the city and talking with people and reconstructing uh, the effects of uh, the, the bomb that used Hanford's plutonium on the city and its occupants. I followed the experiences of a, of a physician who was at the Nagasaki University Medical Hospital in one of these buildings that you see in the foreground of this photograph. He was about a half mile or so from the hypocenter, the point on the ground right beneath where the, um, where the bomb exploded. He was standing behind a thick concrete wall, which is why uh, he did not die. He suffered from very severe radiation poisoning in the weeks and months after the bombing, but, uh, but survived and spent the rest of his life um, studying the effects of the Nagasaki bombing on, on the residents of Nagasaki. And you know, this, this was a very small nuclear weapon. Uh, the nuclear weapons that we have today are 50 times and more powerful than the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, that's why I call my book The Apocalypse Factory. It, it's really not a reference to the site of Hanford itself or the environmental contamination that exists there and the, and the hazards that we face from the site. It's really a reference to the fact that if the plutonium made at Hanford is ever used, uh, human civilization is probably gonna come to an end. We worry a lot about climate change and yet we tend to overlook these nuclear weapons uh, that, that really pose any, uh, an even greater immediate risk uh, to the future of humanity. So uh, Tom, why don't I bring you into the conversation? Uh, Tom's been working for many years to represent the workers who are involved in the cleanup. So I, I was hoping, Tom, you could just give us a quick overview of Hanford Challenge and the work that you do, and then we can talk about some of the more specific details about the site. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um... Really great book, by the way, and uh, folks should go out and get it and read it. I enjoyed reading it, and uh, uh, as Steve said, I, I learned a few things from it that I didn't know, and uh, I have studied uh, Hanford for, for years and years. I really started kind of in 1985 by helping some of the early whistleblowers out there, Ed Bricker, Casey Rood, uh, and others who were bringing forward safety issues. Um, connected with, uh, at the time, production of plutonium, which ended in 1989. Uh, and, you know, so I was, uh, I was seen as, as a problem, and so were they. Uh, 
uh, by the government because what were we doing messing around with their site? Uh, but we were making disclosures about safety issues and um, that were just horrendous in, retros in retrospect, right? The, the doses that workers were getting, the environmental pollution, all this was new. Um, the government was not admitting this at the time. Um, and it turns out that Hanford, uh, in the, as it went through building these nine reactors and uh, taking that spin nuclear fuel and reprocessing it, those chemical um, reprocessing facilities, in the process of doing all that over about 45 years, made Hanford the most contaminated facility in, in the United States and really the Western Hemisphere. So it's really one of the top five contaminated facilities in the world. Um, I don't know exactly where it fits, but if you look at what you know the former Soviet Union had, what Russia had, what you know uh, China, uh, etc., there's uh, some highly contaminated facilities, and you know some of these facilities are are going to be, including Hanford, very problematic. Um, and as Hanford is um, has shown, the uh, the magnitude of this cleanup um, is, is kind of captured by some numbers I can throw out there. We've spent you know, well over $50 billion on the cleanup to date. Uh, we are poised to spend maybe another $500 billion or $600 billion. Uh, and at the end of that, do we really even have a cleanup for sure, right? I mean, this is really the big question in everyone's mind. Uh, it's technically very challenging. Uh, it's it's dangerous work, uh, and there's a lot of political, um, you know, maneuvering going on to you know short shortcut that cleanup, etc. So we kind of step in uh, as a public interest organization. Hanford Challenge was created to over, oversee this cleanup and assure that there's a safe and effective cleanup, uh, because we recognize that as much damage as Hanford has done, it can do a lot more damage into the future simply by not doing anything. If it just sat there and spilled its contents into the Columbia River, or if there was a fire or an explosion, whatever, and it goes airborne, then you're looking at, you know, Fukushima uh, or Chernobyl sized proportions of radionuclides that could uh, make vast areas of, of land uh, uninhabitable, maybe evacuate towns, uh, depending on which way the wind is blowing, obviously unacceptable results. So we're gonna to have to spend money on, on making this site a safe site. Uh, we're going to have to protect the workers uh, during this cleanup, which is probably gonna last another 100 years. Hmm. Um, and we're gonna to have to make sure we have the political will uh, to, to perform all that uh, because it's a lot of money and that money could be used for other things. And we do have climate change coming down uh, the tracks at us and that's gonna be very expensive to deal with the pandemic is obviously very expensive to deal with. I mean, so there's, Camford is gonna to have to compete with a lot of other urgent emergencies. Uh, and we're of course very worried about uh, how it's gonna end up. Yeah, you know, I've always assumed that the biggest challenge that they face out there is the tank waste. I mean, it's astonishing to me that the waste, the chemical and radiological waste that were generated in the Manhattan Project are still sitting there in those tanks. The Department of Energy has really not started removing material from those tanks. And I assume that that's going to be a major portion of the cleanup. But Tom, given your experience with Hanford, what, what do you think are the other big challenges that the Department of Energy faces in trying to clean up the site? Has, is most of the attention now needing to be focused on the tank waste or uh, are there other things that really need, uh, are gonna require big expenditures and it surprises me to hear that it's gonna be a hundred years. I'd, I, I always said that it was gonna be decades, but a hundred years is a long time. Well, that's my own personal. Uh, Very good. That's not their official projection. I'm not sure there's an official projection out there at this point, but, um, uh, and even the numbers uh, of dollars, are, it's a guesstimate, right? So, uh, and there could be technologies uh, invented or, or brought, brought into bear that, you know, make this a lot cheaper and a lot more efficient, and we're all hoping for that. Uh, so, and, so are the reactors in pretty good shape? I mean, the nine reactors down by the Columbia River now, they've, uh, Department of Energy has completed a lot of that work. It's moved a lot of the contaminated soils and equipment up to the central plateau where those tanks are, where the 177 tanks are. They really seem to be with, sort of constraining the area in which they still have a lot of work to do. What do you think about the reactors themselves? Well, I think the reactors can be 
you know, they've done a good job cocooning those reactors, uh, taking away some of the radioactive portions of it. But reactor cores themselves are very hot. Uh, and the idea is to basically leave them in their uh, cocoons or their sarcophagus and let them decay away uh, for 75 to 100 years. And then it'll be less, less radioactive to uh, take care of them in the future. Uh, that is not an urgent issue. The urgent issues, actually one of the top safety concerns in the complex, it comes from the tanks, but uh, at one point the tanks were so hot they were self-boiling. And that was because of the levels of strontium-90 and cesium-137, which not only are radioactively hot, but also give out thermal heat. Uh, and so they said, this isn't good for the tanks, and it's not. It was causing tanks to leak and fail. A third of them have, have leaked and failed. Um, uh, so they uh, treated the waste to remove a good portion of the cesium and strontium-90, and they managed to, uh, I guess, remove about 120 million curies of, of strontium-90 and cesium-137. And they stored that in these big Olympic-sized swimming pools in a building called B-Plant at Hanford. That's decayed down to about 80 or 90 million curies at this point. But, you know, it's, it's very dangerous. These pools have now decayed um, and, and are uh, threat, safety threats. Um, if one of these pools were to fail, um, you know, there's no secondary containment over the pool. They're just metal buildings. They're closet huts. Um, and it wouldn't take anything for, uh, you know, a release to occur and just go straight through. I mean, even 5% of this material leaving the site uh, would be a national disaster of, of a huge magnitude. Um, we measure problematic doses of strontium-90 and cesium-137 in the trillions of a single curie. So when you have 80 million curies, wow. you know, uh, that's a lot of fatal doses. Um, and it lasts a long time and it gets into food supplies and, um, you know, cesium-137 mimics potassium. Strontium-90 mimics um, um, uh, calcium. So it's taken up in the food chain and it goes into organisms and is used uh, as if it were calcium or potassium. And that then it irradiates those organisms and causes all kinds of problems inside. So we've got to make sure that that doesn't happen. That's, that's just an example. One example out of about 15 or 20, I could spin off to you, but won't in the interest of time to say, yeah, this is an urgent issue that we need to uh, sit on top of and make sure it's taken care of. Tom, I have one more question for you. And I'm not just asking you questions to avoid answering questions myself, because I'm sure there's plenty down there in the question and answer box once we take a look at it. But, you know, the Defense Department budget is, is immense at this point, as is the nuclear weapons budget. And there's a great deal of sentiment growing in Washington, D.C. I lived in Washington, D.C. for 35 years and, and sort of know what a groundswell looks like to make serious cuts in the defense budget in a future administration. Uh, perhaps 10% of the defense budget uh, and, and an even larger percentage of the nuclear weapons budget. The cleanup is considered part of the nuclear weapons budget and its budget has always been under pressure and has required a lot of political support to keep it even at this level, which many people feel is inadequate. Um, what, what can people do to help generate support to uh, to maintain and perhaps even increase that Hanford cleanup budget to the level that is needed. And some projections call for quite a bit more money being needed. I mean, we're already spending $2 billion on it a year, but I've seen projections up in this, you know, seven and $9 billion a year category to get this cleanup done. How are we going to get that money out of a budget that's going to be increasingly constrained in the future? That's a great question. And I, mean, I think the simple answer is this issue needs to be nationalized. This needs to be you know, people in the nation need to know that this is happening and that it requires that kind of investment, which is puny when you consider that the Soviet Union uh, and now Russia is, is paying for uh, a Chernobyl disaster. It cost $500 billion uh, and they didn't clean it up. All they did was stabilize it, right? Um, that, and it, it's, uh, they're looking at the cost of the Fukushima cleanup over a trillion dollars, perhaps. So that the cost of you know, an accident like that is incalculable. So you want to spend the money to make sure the cleanup does happen, that you secure 
this stuff, uh, but we need more awareness. And uh, from, from where we sit, um, we've got two very good uh, uh, senators in the state of Washington, two very good senators in the state of Oregon who are paying very close attention to this. It always helps if people are communicating with them and letting them know what's happening, uh, how you feel about that. Uh, we have Adam Smith, uh, who is the chair of the House Armed Services Committee. He's from, he's in my district in Seattle. Uh, he's a very powerful member of the House, sits, you know, appropriates, authorizes the money for the cleanup. He's not going to let that cleanup budget get cut. So as long as we have that kind of uh, protection, we're going to be okay. But we can't assume they always will be there, right? So uh, more, the word has to get out. People have to realize what a crisis this is. Uh, and, and they don't. You know, that's, that's kind of the disturbing part, which is why I'm excited about your book uh, and more books like it is, is uh, you know, it does spread that kind of awareness. There's other people writing books and um, uh, it's just one way to get, get the word out there. Okay, so I'm looking at the questions now that we've been uh, posed and there's some interesting ones. And, uh, and I'm gonna take the first one, but I actually will be interested in your response to this question too, because this is a question I've never asked you before. It's, so I'll, I'll, take, I'll take first crack at this. What surprised you the most about Hanford while researching and writing the Apocalypse Factory? So I'm gonna ask you what surprised you the most in your work with Hanford Challenge. But first, I'll say that what surprised me the most is the number of things that had to come together for nuclear weapons to be developed in World War II. I make the argument that the Manhattan Project probably wouldn't have proceeded if plutonium hadn't been discovered in 1941, and that was just a few months before Pearl Harbor. There is another way to make atomic weapons. You can extract this very rare isotope of uranium from uranium ore, and uh, that's what was done in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and that was the material that fueled the Hiroshima bomb. But it was extremely difficult to do that. By the end of the war, they had exactly, I mean, that, that plant had been running full bore for years, and they had enough material for exactly one bomb. And they would not have had enough uranium to be able to make any more bombs for months after that. It's very difficult to do that. And they knew that at the time in 1941. So when plutonium is all of a sudden discovered, almost coincidentally, by this professor out at the University of California, all of a sudden there are two ways to make atomic bombs. And I think that US scientists and US policymakers uh, decided that if we had two ways to make atomic bombs, then the Germans did as well. And that's what really led to the Manhattan Project. They thought, well, it's gonna be a huge industrial undertaking to separate out uranium-235 from uranium ore. But there are, there are other possibly much smaller scale ways to generate plutonium in a nuclear reactor and then extract it out chemically. And they were very worried about the Germans being able to take that route to a nuclear bomb. And of course, that's why the Manhattan Project started, uh, was to counter the possibility that the Germans could develop an atomic bomb. And then, you know, the other amazing coincidence that happened is that Enrico Fermi over in Colombia uh, <clears throat> had left Italy and was working on a nuclear reactor. And if he hadn't been doing that work, there would have been no way to make plutonium either because only in a nuclear reactor can you make enough neutrons to be able to generate the quantities of plutonium that were needed. So all these things had to happen. You know, whenever you start reconstructing one of these historical processes, you just inevitably come to the conclusion that if you ran history again with a different set of conditions, things would have turned out completely differently. We may not have had nuclear weapons. And if we hadn't had nuclear weapons, the Cold War might have had a completely different trajectory from the very beginning, where we didn't have nuclear weapons and the Soviet Union, where we had nuclear weapons rather, and the Soviet Union didn't. So, um, so that was the thing that most surprised me about Hanford was the sort of the historical coincidences and contingencies that, uh, that were involved in, in, in the building, of the, uh, building and use of the atomic bomb. So, so Tom, what, what, what uh, strikes you as the most surprising thing about Hanford in the time you've been there? Well, um, I think what is most surprising to me is how the culture of secrecy and denial um, have you know, outlived Hanford's Cold War identity. And so there still is very much a uh, insular culture at the Hanford site. Um, people are very much insiders, see everyone else as an outsider, uh, and are resentful that uh, you know, people from Portland uh, or Seattle might care uh, and come in and, and try to tell them what to do uh, when actually you know, they need our help to raise money, uh, 
uh, to get ideas for getting this cleanup going, et cetera. And it, it tends to get into political terms, right? Y'all, you know, you liberals over in Seattle don't understand science, which is not true. Uh, so, you know, what uh, I was surprised that here we are, um, you know, 1989, the uh, cleanup agreement was, was signed. Um, it, it's now 30 years later, uh, and we're still kind of fighting some of those fights. And uh, that, that we still have this, this cultural issue. But I, I'm also surprised by the intractability of these, of these problems. Uh, they're, they're not just economic. There's a huge amount of money that's needed. Uh, they're not just technical, although there are plenty of technical issues. Uh, but they're also managerial. Uh, there's been a lot of management problems out there. There's been a lot of fraud and theft uh, in insider dealing. Uh, anyone who's, you know, paid any attention whatsoever to what the uh, Inspector General has been writing recently and, and the lawsuits uh, from whistleblowers, et cetera, knows that this is true. Uh, and yet there hasn't been any kind of, you know, effort by Congress to say, let's solve this. Let's make it happen. It just hamper just limps along. And what's most disappointing, I think, to everyone, and I'll say this, I think, you know, you know, I'm not going to speak for the Tri-Cities, but I, I've heard a lot of people in the Tri-Cities say that they're also frustrated that by, you know, every two years to four years, there's a new plan. And it's like the old plan, let's just throw that out. And we're not going to stick with that. We're going to do something new. Um, and, you know, so uh, you can't ever rely on what's going to stick and really what's going to uh, keep going. The one thing that has stayed the course throughout that whole time is the tri-party agreement, the, tri uh, the uh, cleanup agreement between the state of Washington, the EPA, and the federal government to you know, clean up Hanford. Um, it's had to bend and shift and, and grotesquely, you know, get out, out, uh, bent out of shape, but it's still there and it's still driving uh, the cleanup. And it says, you have to remove the waste from the Hanford site, treat it, vitrify it, dispose of it in a deep geological repository to an extent where Hanford can be actually safe again. Um, we are far, far away from doing that. And unfortunately, you know, the recent cleanup plans call for abandoning that approach and putting everything in concrete. Uh, that's not going to be a sufficient, you know, cleanup strategy. So, uh, but we do have a change of administration maybe in our future and maybe we'll return to the roots that we need to or, or, or get a court to return the federal government to where it needs to be with the cleanup agreement. But there's a lot to be surprised at uh, with Hanford. The secrecy is a, is a big part of it for me. Yeah, I've always thought that that culture of secrecy is one reason why people know so little about Hanford. As I mentioned briefly, I grew up just 15 miles away from Hanford, just on the other side of Saddle Mountains from the facility in the 1960s and 1970s. And we knew it was over there. And at that point, uh, it was known that uh, it generated plutonium for people who are maybe more interested in science. But boy, beyond that, you did not know much. And um, th that facility was surrounded by high barbed wire fences. As you know, people like my grandfather who worked at Hanford were told that they couldn't even tell their family members what it is that they did there. Uh, so, um, yeah. And, and, uh, and even though the site has been open since 1990 and the Tri-Party Agreement, uh, the, 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 the atmosphere of secrecy still does surround the site. I definitely agree with that. Oh yeah. There's okay, let's look for the disclosure next. agreements that workers have to sign. Oh yeah, so right. That's they a, can't that's talk a to the press. This. Right, so that, that's still the case. I mean, uh, workers have to sign, everyone that comes to work for Hanford has to sign a non-disclosure agreement, agreeing to what? I'm, Curious, because this does fit into the secrecy argument. You know, so it's uh, it's not official. It's not na national security anymore. Right. But um, all the workers out there have been told you can't leak video to the news media because so many embarrassing videos were being leaked, right? And you can't talk to the press without first checking with us, which is, you know, uh, totally inappropriate. People have a freedom of speech in this country, and yes, they can't reveal anything that's um, you know, illegal to, uh, to disclose, which includes security information, but there's very little at Hanford that, that actually, um, you know, impinges on that. So really it's just, let's stanch the bad news from coming out of the site, which is why we have whistleblowers. We do have rights uh, to talk about safety issues and other things and make those disclosures. And when they get fired, we sue on their behalf to get their jobs back and, and that kind of thing. 
we better get going on some of these other questions because uh, we have to have 20 minutes and there's plenty of questions here. And this one is kind of for me, although I'm not going to have a good uh, response to it. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on why it was considered necessary or even acceptable to divert an immense amount of resources toward the Manhattan Project during the war. Was it not possible to focus the Allied effort toward continually hindering or neutralizing the German effort instead, probably for a fraction of the resources spent toward the Manhattan Project? I've thought a lot about this issue, about why we did not know more about the German nuclear program. And people have written whole books about the German nuclear program. You know, it never really got off the ground at just about the time that we were deciding to build Hanford and Oak Ridge and bring together scientists in Los Alamos to construct the bomb. The German program was going seriously off course. And yet no one in the United States seems to, I mean, choices, essentially choices were made in Germany to put their resources in, into other directions. The program did um, sort of sputter along in Germany, but they never got close to even producing a nuclear reaction, much less being able to make plutonium. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union had spies throughout the Manhattan Project, probably in all three sites. I, I note in the book that, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union decided to make its own nuclear weapon at the beginning years of the Cold War, essentially they decided the fastest way to do that would just be to copy almost exactly uh, the facilities at Hanford and the bomb that Hanford produced. Uh, the Soviet's first weapon in 1949 was essentially a replica of the bomb exploded at the Trinity test and at the Nagasaki test site. So espionage in the U.S. program was extensive and yet we, uh, even as late as 1944 and 1945, General Groves, who led the Manhattan Project, is putting together teams to send to Germany to try to get some sense over what the Germans have accomplished and whether or not a bomb is on the way and to look for nuclear reactors. Um, it's always surprised me that there was not more intelligence information available. I, I, I can only presume that the US just did not have much capabilities in that area uh, at the beginning of World War uh, II, regardless of how much those um, capabilities grew in the, during the Cold War. Yeah, the rest of this question says, it feels like a baffling intelligence failure, failure by the allies in terms of understanding how far the Nazis, Nazis were from building a fission bomb. And I, I definitely do agree. It's a, it's a very mysterious thing. Well, you know, but, but I think the whole premise of the question, um, even if we knew that Germany wasn't close to making a bomb, we'd still want to have that bomb develop because the way of thinking of the military would have been someone's going to do it and we might as well have it, right? And of course we want super bombs. And, um, you know, when the, the time came to debate whether or not we should expand from, you know, simple atomic weapons to, you know, hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear weapons, which are, you know, 20 megaton, 30 megaton, uh, you know, just behemoths. I mean, these are, these are doomsday devices, right? Uh, a lot of scientists were arguing against it, saying this is idiocy, right? We need to make these things illegal. Um, and, you know, I'm one of those people that says, yes, you should make these things illegal. You should not use them in warfare because it is the end of all civilization. And whatever dispute or spat you have going on right now about, you know, politics or whatever, it's just not worth that. There's nothing that's worth that. And yet we still have these large stockpiles. And, uh, but that was a debate that was happening at the time. And there's a military mindset that says we want the most effective biggest, baddest weapon that we can get our hands on. And they did it all in secrecy. There was never any kind of like, let's present this to the American people and see what you guys think, right? That was all a secret program. And that really was a turning point, I think in American democracy was, you know, the whole secrecy that built up around the Atomic Energy Act and, and allowed them to create these, you know, super secret programs that the rest of us couldn't know anything about. It was very anti-democratic actually. And yet the Manhattan Project was undertaken with such urgency. I mean, Groves drove people so hard and worked 24 seven himself. It's just astonishing when you look at something like the B-reactor that it could have been, been built so quickly. Sometimes I say that when people call for a new Manhattan Project on something like the pandemic, mm -hmm. they're referring not just to a gigantic government effort that you would hope succeed, but also to the speed with which the Manhattan Project was able to, to get uh, bombs built. So, um, I would tend to agree with you, but I, but I also think that um, we might not have had bombs ready by the end of World War II, and that's a situation in which World War II could have ended very differently 
if we had known that the German program was making no progress, that there may not have been the same urgency among the people driving the program and working at the program in places like Los Alamos. But, you know, the, uh, the war with the Germans was over and we, we still use the bombs. So there's another issue there. It's not like, okay, now we have to compete against Germany, but here's Japan, let's go ahead and bomb them. Right. There's a, a great article that was just out today, uh, you know, calling to question all of the assumptions behind, was this the right thing to do to, to bomb Japan? And oh, it saved a million lives. Uh, you know, there were 740,000 soldiers there. And, you know, the assumption was that maybe you know, 8% to 10% of them would perish, right? Which is not an insubstantial number, but it's not a million lives. So there's like an overstating of the case. And then there's the, the knowledge that they were beaten. And do we actually need to invade for that, for that war to be over? And uh, Truman had decided that we really didn't need to invade, except for the Soviet Union was trying to come into the war. So we wanted to make sure they didn't get any foothold in Asia. Right, so that was, there's a lot of political reasons that went into that, but I think it, it emphasizes the point that we, you know, this changed everything. Uh, as Einstein said, everything's now changed except our way of thinking. Yeah. It's pretty scary. So I'll, I'll, I'll cover a couple of these myself. How did you organize your research so you could find a particular topic for a scene you wanted to write? You know, this is what my fifth trade book, and I've written many, many other books in other contexts. And this was probably the most difficult one I have ever written. And um, if someone had told me at the beginning of this project, you know, when you start to write this book, you're going to have to read a lot of what has already been written about the Manhattan Project, even though very little has been written about Hanford. But I had to know the entire context uh, to be able to write about it and connected to the other things that were going on in the Manhattan Project in World War II. Boy, I, I, I might have questioned my sanity heading into that because as you know, Tom, there are just thousands of books that have been written about the Manhattan Project. And I really struggled with that. I have, I have about 20 boxes full of books sitting out here in my bedroom uh, that I uh, made my way through. Uh, thank goodness for Audible so that I could listen to a lot of those books while I was driving around and just sort of crammed that information in my head at all times. And then it was a matter of, um, you know, the, the, the struggle of writing to just figure out what's the best way to tell the story. Who should I tell the story about? Uh, which, which of these many characters that were involved in the Manhattan Project are the, are the best options for putting together a continuous narrative? And I made for myself the additional challenge of wanting to tell the whole story really from the very beginning of, well, really the discovery of the neutron in 1932, up through the discovery of plutonium in 41, and then up to the present day, dealing with some of these cleanup issues. Here's another question for me. What happened medically to the people who played on the football field? <clears throat> and so it's a, sort of a question about the people who were at Fermi's initial nuclear reactor. I actually discussed this in the book because as I say in the book, Rumors uh, circulate widely even before the uh, invention of the internet. And there was this widespread rumor that everyone, everyone who had been with Fermi uh, watching that original experiment died early of cancer, uh, that those statistics were actually gathered on the 42 people and one woman, Leona Woods, the physicist Leona Woods, who was there and their mortality and what they died of. And um, no, there's, there's no indication that any exposure to radiation uh, that they experienced during that experiment, experiment caused them any harm. Uh, the football field had been canceled by, I mean, the football uh, team at the University of Chicago uh, was so pathetic in the uh, 1930s that they canceled the program. And so those stands, when you see pictures of them, there are trees growing in the stands because uh, nobody has sat in them for a long time. But underneath the stands, they had this huge set of athletic facilities one thing I discovered while writing this book and going to the University of Chicago, of course, the stands aren't there anymore, but there's still incredible stuff in the library, is that uh, it's usually said that Fermi built, I mean, this is a small point, it's usually said that Fermi built that first reactor in a squash court. But many people at the University of Chicago have pointed out in places like the Alumni Magazine, you know, it wasn't a squash court, it was a rackets court. And a rackets court is quite a different size and configuration than a squash court. And that's actually part of what made the experiment possible. Fermi put a lot of his equipment up on a balcony that sits in rackets courts. Anyway, small things like that. You can, it's amazing that even after hundreds and thousands of people have written about these things, there are still things that you can dig up. Does the book talk about the amazingly quick building of the entire Hanford science community, the alphabet houses, et cetera? I do touch upon that because it was such an incredible build, uh, process, not only the construction of Hanford itself, but of Richland, 
uh, Richland is still, and Tom and I have both spent many, much, a lot of time in Richland. Still a very interesting town. Um, another writer named Kate Brown has written an entire book called Plutopia, uh, which is about Richland and the corresponding, uh, um, Richland and Hanford and the corresponding facilities in the, in the Soviet Union, and uh, makes some astute observations about um, the, the strange circumstances under which Richland uh, was developed and expanded. Um, I, I was just a kid when I uh, first experienced Richland and even then got a, got a sense of how Richland was kind of a, a different place. The regional West, Eastern Washington science fairs were held there. Today, Richland uh, is one of the Tri-Cities, Richland, Kennewick and Pasco, quite different cities. Uh, and the dynamics among those three cities ever since the beginning of the Manhattan Project has been very interesting. And especially for a person who lives there and who was a kid there and sort of got a sense of those dynamics from going to swim meets and playing in basketball games and all the kinds of things that we did in the Tri-Cities. You get to, it was, it was just fascinating for me to spend a lot of time in the Tri-Cities and try to understand both how they, how they came to be what they were like in the, in the 1960s and also how they've changed them. What advice do you have for other authors, journalists who want to write about Hanford? Tom, I'm going to kick that over to you. You mentioned some other books that were being done, and there have been some very good books written about more specific aspects of Hanford. My book is sort of the first trade book that tries to cover the whole story from the beginning to the end, but there have been very good books about whistleblowers, about some of the environmental hazards, um, Kate Brown's book about Plutopia. What other ones would you recommend? Well, uh, one of my favorites is Crisis of Conscience by Tom Muller, and uh, it's got a chapter on Hanford. It's about 70 pages, and it talks a lot about the whistleblowers, but he also talks in there, he kind of treats the whole subject of Hanford's contamination um, in, in a way that um, uh, is, is compelling. So that, that's a great book, and I, I certainly recognize, uh, would, would, uh, uh, would urge people to look at that book. Crisis of Conscience by Tom Muller. Um, you know, I, uh, there's been, if you want to get into the, the technical issues of Hanford, uh, some of the, you know, uh, Hanford in its own words, um, it's called On the Home Front. Mm -hmm. And is, is written right. by a historian who uh, moved into the Hanford site, into the Hanford area, and was bored and said, oh, what's going on out here? And then took advantage of you know, some of the openness that happened in the 90s under Bill Clinton uh, and, and Hazel O'Leary, who's the Secretary of Energy, has started delving into uh, Hanford's history and looking at all these declassified documents. And uh, the author of that book, um, you know, has put out several versions of it to update it as she's found more on the home front and uh, really just a, a fantastic book. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of books on Hanford. Yeah. You know, you know, I should mention, oh, one of my favorite, for sure. Yeah. I should mention, too, the work of Annette Carey, the reporter at the Tri-City Herald, who has been writing about Hanford for many years, and just an incredible source of information in that newspaper about what's going on at Hanford uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So she's really covering the issues around, that are out there and, and knows that issue so well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, she's she could write a book herself. And yes, I'm sure. He's a survivor. A lot of reporters kind of went native and burned out and started writing, you know, things that, you know, about Hanford that uh, got them fired, uh, you know. Oh, really? Uh, but she's, she's managed to hang on and, and keep her job and do a great job. And I'm, I'm just always amazed at her, her reporting. And that's one of the first go-tos. The other is uh, King 5 TV. Susanna Frame has done amazing. Um, just go to YouTube, you know, put in Hanford and King 5 and uh, you'll see a lot of the great TV stories that she's done. She's won awards for that. And uh, so there's, yeah, no shortage of, of resources for people who want to get involved. And I would also, of course, direct people to our website where we have tons of resources, hamperchallenge.org. We're a public interest organization and we survive on, on donations and, uh, you know, bake sales and auctions and whatnot. And, um, uh, but we try to be a resource for the public as well as for workers at the site and keep them safe. 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to answer one more question, and then I'm going to kick one back to you. And uh, the one I'm going to kick back to you has to do with the vitrification plant. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a technical detail, but an important one in the context of the cleanup. Are the issues surrounding Hanford specific, this is the one I'm going to take, are they specific to its being on the forefront of nuclear technology, or do other nuclear plants in the country have similar issues? Hanford has some issues that it shares with other plants, and there is an operating nuclear power plant the Columbia Generating Station that is right next to Hanford. It's Washington State's one operating nuclear plant. And so it has all of the issues that other nuclear plants have. But there are issues at Hanford that are really specific to its history. There are a couple of other cleanup sites that Tom and I have discussed at various times in the past scattered around the United States, including one in South Carolina. So during the Cold War, it was decided that uh, it was too risky to have only one plutonium production facility at Hanford because uh, one of the greatest concerns was that it was within range of Russian bombers. And so it was always a possibility that Hanford could be shut down. A decision was made that a second plant had to be built. And so five additional reactors were built in South Carolina. And ha Hanford made about two thirds, maybe 70% of all the plutonium produced in the United States, but that South Carolina site made another third or 30%. Um, there's a extensive cleanup going on there as well. They have their own tanks. Uh, but even in that case, the tanks at South Carolina are, uh, pose very different challenges than the tanks at Hanford for a variety of reasons having to do with the, just the history and the ways in which chemicals and compounds were combined at the Hanford plant. So Tom, do you want to say a little bit about that and about um, where we, the, the vitrification plant? It's 658, so unfortunately we have to keep this pretty short and we could talk about the vitrification plant for a half hour. So. Oh yeah, I could talk about that plant for several hours, but I'll just say that it's in trouble. And uh, technically, um, you know, a lot of issues were found with the design that were brought forward by whistleblowers, not just any whistleblowers, but the manager of, uh, you know, environmental and nuclear technology, uh, nuclear safety, Donna Bushy and, and Walt Tanisitis, who was the uh, manager of research and technology and the chief engineer all became whistleblowers and uh, pointed out some very serious design flaws, which turned out to be all true. And uh, that really kind of knocked, you know, parts of that plant, you know, off of, offline in terms of it was never operating, but uh, they're now projecting that to fix, for instance, the low activity, uh, the high, uh, the, the pretreatment plant, um, it's going to cost $7 billion. Well, the whole plant was supposed to cost $4.6 billion, all, all the facilities. So just the repair costs, and you just have to think, well, maybe it's quicker and easier if they just bite the bullet and rebuild parts of those, those facilities and build them right and, and uh, do it right uh, you know, the second time. Uh, but right now, we, we really can't count on those facilities to vitrify the waste, except for maybe the low activity waste which is next to useless because we have the high level waste that's really the, uh, the important part of, of the plant. So big plant, big troubles, um, and we're very disappointed in, in everything that's happened there. Yeah, vitrification, the process of taking that waste and making it into glass logs. Yeah. Of course, we don't really have any place to put those glass logs. It would be in a safer form, but uh, because we don't have a high level nuclear waste repository in this country, they would just have to sit at Hanford even after they're generated. We favor the technology. Uh, but we don't, you know, we're obviously stuck in the mud. Uh, Tom, there is one, yeah, there is one last question I want to answer. So I'm, I'm going uh, okay. so I'm, I'm to get to that one. And, and you've already stated your opinion on this matter. So I want to state mine as well. And here it is. The question is, we call ourselves homo sapiens. Well, all evidence points to us being homo stultus. With all the doomsday scenarios that stare us in the face, all of our own making, shouldn't we voluntarily eschew nuclear military options. And my response to that is absolutely. Uh, we do have to get rid of these weapons. Um, at the end of my book, I talk about something called the Fermi paradox. And uh, that is that uh, something with even a small probability of happening, if given enough time, will happen. And we have come close to destroying human civilization several times using these weapons that are made possible with the plutonium that was manufactured at, at um, Hanford. And, and we have to get rid of these weapons or else um, someday yes. <laughs> there's just no doubt about it. So, you know, unfortunately, right at the moment, we're sort of going in the wrong direction, but there, there is a movement and that movement is becoming increasingly active. 
for the past several years and it's gaining a lot of impetus this week with the 75th anniversary uh, commemorations of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so I really urge people to pay attention to the work that's being done by a, a large variety of groups in the United States and internationally to get rid of these weapons. I mean, uh, people don't know about Hanford. I sit here in Seattle and 20 miles to my Northwest is the uh, Kitsap Naval Base uh, where our nuclear submarines uh, um, are stationed. And there are a thousand deployed nuclear weapons that are within 20 miles of Seattle. A lot of people don't know that, um, but there's a small group of people that has been protesting the presence of that base and the use of nuclear weapons for a long time. In my book, I profile an activist in the Tri-Cities who has been working for decades on these issues. And uh, there, are, there are people in the Tri-Cities who have worked hard and go out and hold up signs in the Tri-Cities uh, to the workers that are going to Hanford. I mean, those are, those are small steps, but each one of these steps can eventually contribute to something much larger. I mean, I'm, I, Tom, your, your concerns are sort of different, but, but you know, we both Not really. think I, about these weapons a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Read so. the Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg, who was an insider. Yes. Um, really amazing book. Uh, and if Absolutely. you have any questions about where we are with nuclear weapons and, and human beings just being the wrong species to handle these things, oh, read that book. It's just amazing. So yeah, anyway, this was very entertaining and very interesting. Uh, all viewers out there should read Steve's book, The Apocalypse Factory. Order it. You can see uh, a link there on, on, the, on the side. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. He's a great writer. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Tom. Now it's great. Very nice of you to say that. And here's Emily. <laughs> well, that was wonderful, both of you. Thank you so much for coming. That was really great to hear all about that. Um, I could listen to you guys talk about that for a whole lot longer, but as right now we need to wrap it up for the night. So thank you both so much, and thank you everyone out there. Um, please consider purchasing a copy of the book online at pebbles.com and check out our other upcoming events. Uh, take care until then and have a good night. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Emily.